Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full showtimes, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Brian Freed. He's a serial inventor, published author, executive director of United Inventors Association of America, and founder of InventorSmart. Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I I think, well, you've done a ton of stuff. You're doing a ton of stuff. But maybe before we get into all that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Sure. I originally am from Brooklyn, and I moved to Long Island. My parents moved us out to Long Island to just have a different quality of life and and be able to go to... uh, some of the fine schools here and uh and just continued to build and found a, a wife and have a have a daughter she just turned 17 very cool and uh just very active in in my communities and and relations uh on long island especially in the inventor world very cool so you went to university what did you take and why i'll tell you i took public relations, communications, okay, and psychology. And I thought that was interesting because I knew that I wanted to be involved with business, marketing, just in that field. But sure. I said, you know what? No matter what you do in life, I think one of the most important things is being able to communicate to people, no sure. matter what industry you're in. So there you go. Public relations, communications, speaking, and... uh then also talking about psychology. So there's a different reason and, and a lot of whys on what people do and how people do it. So I guess that kind of ended up with inventor related items too, because through my products, I'm communicating to people and psychology is the reason why people are buying or what they're doing and how they're doing it and trying to make it better. Interesting. So, Walk me through your career and some of the stuff that you've invented because you've done a ton of stuff and it's actually quite fascinating. Thank you. Well, I realized back in the day that I would be ripping apart my toys and not in an aggressive way, but more of a curiosity way. And I started to just see and pay attention more to how things work and why people use things. And there was a point where I just started to write them down okay? because I had so many ideas. And one of the most important things when you come up with something is being able to capture it. And I wasn't doing that in the beginning, but I tried to round up some of the things that I thought were interesting back from whenever I was thinking about them. And many of them have already been invented or being used. Right. So I just sifted through it. I made a really good spreadsheet. Okay. And classified them in certain categories and industries and just said, take me out of the equation for a second. What about other people? And what are they doing different? So I started to do that. And then I got married and realized that some of my items were even better than the other ones. And then I had a daughter uh, and we were going through that whole parenthood cycle and realized that there's some things there that could be interesting. So I just, again, I started to sift through them, think about other people and what they would do and how they would use it, and just started to come up with, uh, from a from a marketing perspective in a way, what would work and what wouldn't work, and, and started to have some levels of success with, with those that did. Okay, so give us some examples of some of the stuff that you've actually brought to market. Sure. Well, there's many that I haven't brought to market, but sure. the ones that I have... Uh, or there was one called the Balloon Band. That was one of my first ones, where it was okay. a nylon wristband with a metal D-ring on it okay. that a kid would put around the, the wrist. Yeah. Uh, and you would take the Mylar balloon with uh, with the balloon uh, ribbon, and you'd put it through the D-ring, if okay. you can, if everybody can visualize that. Yeah. And you, you tie it on the D-ring, and the wristband is on. So anytime a kid wants to take the balloon on or off, 
they could do that with the nylon wristband with the with the Velcro on it. Sure. And if they let go of it, it wouldn't fly away. <laughs> sure, sure. And the reason I came up with it originally is because we were going to these these shows at Madison Square Garden, okay. uh, like Elmo's World and everything else. And right. I would I would end up buying I think it was eight dollars. Now it's probably eleven or fifteen for a, a Elmo Sesame Street balloon. Sure. And you tie you tie it around the kid's wrist, and uh, it, it would be too tight where you're cutting off the circulation, or or it ends up on the top of Madison Square Garden, and all the kids are hysterical crying. Sure. <laughs> so I wanted to come up with a better way to save uh, kids balloons and make an easier experience for the kid and, and the parent. And, and also when you go into amusement parks, they make you take the balloon off before you go on a ride. So it was on and off, on and off cutting it where there's no more ribbon left or you're making it too loose and the balloon is flying away. So just try to come up with a better way for that. Okay. And then just getting into the kitchen when my, when, when I got, well, I guess the balloon band was when I had my daughter, but even before that, I had uh, a microwave cooker that okay. has a twist and it drains from the bottom. Uh, so, and, and that one is you, you can cook pasta and rice and vegetables and meals to make in, in the microwave. And I, I watch my wife make pasta, some kind of pasta dish, and I realized so many steps that she was taking. She was boiling water in a pan. After, okay. And then putting the pasta in and then taking the pasta and, and putting it in a strainer that was in the sink and then and then putting paper towel all over the counter to put the strainer on top of so it didn't leak on the counter and then putting it into another serving dish. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So I kind of consolidated all that into one. So I, I have that. Uh, I have uh, adjustable tongues that, uh, you know, the top part of the food tongues. Uh, yep. that you pull up and it locks the tongs in place. Yep. So I came up with uh, actually putting grooves in that piece, that metal piece on top. It was doing nothing, just all that real estate there. Okay. And, uh, and, and now when you're using food tongs, you have small, medium, and large opening for it, depending on what type of food you have. So those have been active also collecting royalties from that. By, uh, between, and, and I have other ones. I mean, I've had, Several as seen on TV, my pull ties, uh, which are a bag sealer uh, that I was on QVC for two and a half, three years. I mean, I, I have 15 of them, Justin, uh, uh, Kevin. So I'm not sure if I if you want me to go through every one. Uh, no, but no, I think that's good. And, and people can go uh, to your website and, and, and check it out. It, it's just brianfreed.com and you, you list them all there. But I, I think it just made sense to cover a few of them. So people have some sort of idea of a bit of your background and, and that you've actually been really successful doing this stuff. But do you want to talk a bit more about your involvement with United Inventors Association of America and, and uh, how did you become executive director? Thank you, Kevin. You know what? I've been involved with inventor groups around the country for a long time, but on okay. Long Island. I've had two inventors groups that I started over 12 years ago for Nassau County and Suffolk. And I merged them together with having the Long Island Inventors and Entrepreneurs Club. So just being active in the community on Long Island uh, and being involved with other inventors clubs around the country and speaking and, and getting active. I mean, just being somebody who, and, and also my books and just my radio show that I had back uh, back a few years back, just being involved in the inventor community and trying to get the message out that if you have an invention, what to do next and how to do it and who to go to and how to take the steps to making it into reality and doing the best you can to get there. So just being out there, I think, has brought me to the position of being able to represent the United Inventors Association, uh, 15,000 plus inventors that are yeah. members and the membership is free uh a, a amazing board of directors 15 board of directors from different parts of the invention process i guess you could call it sure uh, that are resources for inventors and just really interesting including a former uh employee of the u.s patent and trademark office just really good resources all around and what we do is we're active with providing resources and tools and, and learning 
for the inventor community and then also being involved with the inventors groups as well as trade shows, the major trade shows. Right. So we have areas that we give inventors an opportunity to uh, sometimes get reduced pricing and being in a certain area. So buyers and potential licensees, which are manufacturers with distribution, they also can come around the area. And, and if they're looking for new product, uh, engage in conversation and, and be able to connect with inventors with new ideas there. Okay. Very cool. So what are you doing now? Because you're still in very much involved in the community and you're in an active inventor still, correct? Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm working on my own invention still uh, and also working with other inventors' products okay. and ideas. And I have to say, you know what? Most of the time, it's many inventors come to me and they're so excited and they have an emotional connection to their idea and, and they're they're wishing that this idea is the million dollar idea and it's going to help them and help their families. And I want that for them. Sure. But the most important thing for them to do is do a simple search online and see if there's items or products that are out there that are similar. And that's when you have to start making some real decisions on if it's something you want to move forward with or maybe, maybe to move on to your next idea. Um, so I've been active with my own inventions, other inventors, products, uh, I've been manufacturing products, uh, licensing, which again are manufacturers with distribution and, and uh, a way for myself and inventors to earn royalties from their ideas and just giving as much advice as I can out there and passing the word to inventors that, hey, I'm nothing special. If I could do it, you could do it too. Okay, so I, I want to dive a bit deeper into the whole process because – you like well people can go to your website and see like you've had some big products get into some very big retailers so mm -hmm. walk us through a bit of the process of actually going from idea to getting into a store and maybe on QVC because that in itself is quite daunting right but you've obviously done it a number of times you help people through that so Walk us through a bit of the process and, and what people need to kind of think about and, and maybe some um, tips along the way. For sure. First off, when you come up with that idea, you want to go through, like I said, to do a search and to clear up if it's something that is possible or not. Okay. And then you want to be able to bring it to reality to a point where you're making a prototype. And again, the way I used to rip things up, I still do. Uh, and try to find things that already exist to be able to see it feel it, maybe get close to it. And, and then I, I get some kind of intellectual property protection. So before that, if I need to, I have a CAD drawing done, which is a 3D model of, of my idea, right. converted into uh, a, a prototype. And it's so easy to make prototypes these days. Like now 3D I have printing, you mean? That I can or... Yeah, 3D okay. printing. Okay. Yep. okay. And, uh, and, and then I have it, and I have to start making some decisions. So I usually get a provisional patent application okay. uh, or it might be a design uh, a patent application that I file. So I have some patent pending status and then I start to make a decision if I'm going to manufacture or if I'm going to license it. And manufacturing, okay. we're talking about putting together, finding a factory, uh, producing it. Now you're talking about accounts payable, accounts receivable, shipping, warehousing, all that good stuff. Uh, and being in your business. And uh, obviously it's more risk, but there's greater reward. There's bigger margins there, hopefully, to as, as a business person putting that together. Or you might want to license it where you're adding your product to somebody else's existing product line, being able to work with a manufacturer with the distribution and earning a royalty for yourself. So that's the part that is the fork in the road for inventors. Uh, the other parts before that are, are very possible. Okay. Now it's either you're coming up with money or you need to pitch your idea. And I've had success with both. Um, you have, let's say my um, pull ties, for example, or, yeah. you know, what I mentioned that before, let's say my snack of spheres, okay. which I have Elmo cookie monster and all the teenage mutant Ninja turtles on. So, 
that situation, uh, I came up with this idea. I thought it was interesting. It looked like it could have a face on it. And basically it's, a, uh, you know, Kevin, you know, when you go into like someplace, even a party and you see people sticking their hands in a bowl. Yep. It kind of skeeved me out. So what I sure. did was I wanted a replica. I wanted to, uh, hopefully it does to a lot of people, but maybe it doesn't for some, <laughs> um, I wanted to replicate this scooping type of experience. So I came up with this ball and let's say you cut half of it, like one half of it in half and you open it up. So now it looks like almost a mouth and then you could scoop out whether it's potato chips or pretzels or jelly beans or whatever, uh, cereal, you scoop it out and then you, you have your, whatever it is, the food in there, and then you can close it. And now you can carry it around and, you know, the mom can put it in her pocketbook. Guy, dad can hold it. The kid can hold it in their hand or put it in their in the cup holder. But anyway, I thought it would look cool to have a face on it. So sure. I went to uh, and trade shows are gold for me. Like I love trade shows, especially in the industry. So I ended up going to a potential licensee. Okay. And I showed it to them and I said it would look cool with a face on it. And they were just getting into Sesame Street and Nickelodeon. Okay. And uh, there we go. So now every time one sells, Nickelodeon and Sesame Street Street get paid, and so do I. And obviously the, the manufacturer. Sure. Okay, so walk me through – so you go to these trade shows with a prototype at, at some level, probably based on, on the idea, and you're literally just walking up to vendors and pitching your idea. Is, is that what I'm getting from this? I do more research before that, actually, oh, Kevin. You okay. know what I do? Okay. I first off, I go to the store. Like I love to go shopping. Okay. And not only for myself, but also to think and and to get some ideas. Okay. Because many ideas are out there, but you're coming up with a new way to do it, and I just that's just my inspiration. So when I come up with that idea, um, well, what, what was the what was the part, Kevin? What were you saying? Well, the, just like you go to these trade shows and literally with a prototype oh, right. or something, and then you're you're literally just pitching your ideas to these these companies, right? Yes, yes, yes. What I do is what I'm and and the point I was making with going shopping is that I'm going to the stores and I'm taking a look to see where my idea would actually be. Is it in a big box retailer? Is it in a boutique store? Is it in a specialty store? Okay. And is it online? Is it in a catalog? So I go and I start to search the products that are already existing. Okay. And I flip over the boxes and I look to see the manufacturer that's on there. There's sometimes it says distributed by, but okay. then there's always the brand name or the manufacturer. So I write them down and then I go back home and I do research and I take, I take a look and see what kind of products they have. Does my product make sense? Do they sell tires and I'm trying to sell them a kitchen gadget? You know, right. is it, I'm giving an extreme example, but, you sure. want to be able to find the right contact as close as you can or the company. Okay. And I research them. And then I also see some of the trade shows and I have resources for where to look up trade shows. Uh, one I use is TSNN.com trade show news network. Okay. TSNN.com. And I look to see, but now I, I I'm in the zone already of different trade shows that I understand and I go to. Right. And I, I look to see if those companies that I wrote my list down, are going to be at one. Okay. And let's say there's one coming up and I missed it or I missed it. Then I'll start to do some due diligence and research to start to make phone calls to them. Okay. And, so you're cold calling. And that's what I'm doing. Yeah, or emailing I, I, or whatever. Right. I'm, I'm in the industry where I know many of the contacts or potential licensees. Right. But just like now, there's many inventors that contact me because they prefer that they don't make cold cold calls and I might know the contacts or I might make cold calls in certain industries gotcha. and, uh, and, and act as a, a licensing agent for them. Got you. Okay. So how does it like in your experience when you're cold calling or, or pitching live at these trade shows, is there certain things people should do or not do, or does it really depend and it's kind of up to the person to figure out what works for them individually? Sure. Well, the good thing is that many of the trade shows are inventor friendly where you can sign up as a guest and, okay. and search the floor. But many, many companies and, and trade shows lately, 
they don't want like those companies are spending a lot of money on the booths, uh, the exhibitors, uh, the manufacturers, and it, it's tough. They're focused on speaking to buyers and, and potential opportunities. And, and then all of a sudden, Brian with his, with his luggage is coming around, sure. uh, you know, showing me prototypes. So I, I attempt to call them first. I email them. I connect up with them on the phone. Okay. And I let them know that I'm going to be at the trade show and I'm looking for a few minutes of time. And, and sometimes I book time or they just tell me to stop by. Okay. But I'll tell you the the credibility from just being active on QVC and, and having products in the market. I've built up a reputation uh, I see. that I, I either have my own products or other inventors and I vet them properly and I do my due diligence before I present it to them. I see. And they know that we're ready to do a deal. So, again, you're trusted in the space. A, yeah. Yeah, I've done this a little bit longer than some people, and you could do it too. It's just how quickly do you want to get your idea out to market? And I might be able to save some time there just from my experience and my connections. Sure, I got you. So how did you get your stuff on QVC? Because I think a lot of people, that's kind of the the holy grail, right? (laughs) It is a great place for inventors to launch a new product. That's for sure. Okay. Um, actually, speaking of trade shows, when I said it was gold, I wasn't kidding. I ended up taking a bunch of my products to a trade show. Okay. And I met a QVC uh, buyer there, actually okay. it's a senior buyer. Okay. And I showed her my products and I showed her, uh, actually she invited me to, uh, to come meet because I had some things that she was interested in and I was showing and I'm like, I have this, I have this, I have it. I showed her the, and then she was like, okay, those are good. And then she's like, you have any more? And I'm like, and I have this. And it was something that wasn't done yet, but it was almost done. Okay. And she's like, I want that. Interesting. <laughs> so um, it, it's good because you you could do, and you're going to have to manufacture uh, to be on, on QVC. They don't, they don't manufacture for you, but they're, they're a, a great partner and a great opportunity to, to launch there because you provide the inventory, they provide the airtime and the customers, and they give you a shot on air. And if it ends up selling, then they continue to go. And if it doesn't, no hard feelings, they're going to send you your product back. So hopefully you have uh, a, a plan B in case you do get the, the inventory back. But if you're, if you're doing well on there and they're doing well, then you'll continue for a long time. And that's how I was on air with my own inventions and other inventors' products. I was on for two and a half years. Interesting. So when you say you were on uh, for two and a half years, yeah. do you, well, you're not on your, is that like once a month, once a, once a quarter or how does that kind of work? It's whenever they tell you to be on. Okay. Okay. You're kind of at the, at the, they, they give you a little time and uh, they send you an email and let you know when you're going to be on air. So when I'm talking about being on QVC, I was on air myself as a on air guest for two and a half years, but I have had other products on and my own products on that uh, have had other uh, QVC hosts uh, take over for me uh, and, and I would earn royalties from it. Okay. So how do they decide whether they want you on doing it or, or somebody else? Um, Sometimes they tell you like, there's been times where I've had uh, where they say, Brian, we want you on as the inventor, or we want one of the experts in the industry on, like my microwave cooker that put on uh, an expert in the industry. So there, you you work a plan together because you both wanted to be successful your sure. launches, and and they they help to make decisions. But you know, there's QC, they do a great job with quality control, okay. making sure that whatever you're 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 making or or having a customer use that they, they, they do very vigorous due diligence because if somebody has a, an issue, uh, they're able to pull up any information and, and be able to help a customer. Okay. So, I mean, it, it's great. I mean, the, the margins are, are good. Hopefully, when you're manufacturing, you make the right decisions with, uh, with what your price points are. And if it ends up working out where it's a good quality and value for a QEC customer, then, uh, then, then you have that working in your favor and that's where you can move forward so besides doing my own inventions and manufacturing and also licensing to companies that have also been a a manufacturer that works with qvc i've also now been working with companies and helping them and guiding them through 
the QVC process. Gotcha. And that's been interesting too. That's been a, a new part of my business where I'm helping inventors, but I'm also working with major corporations and companies uh, in different sizes to be able to uh, connect with inventors and also to work some of the shopping experience uh, uh, channels that I that I've had uh, in the past. Sure. No, that makes sense. So I want to get back into how you actually work with inventors. At what point should I reach out to you with my invention to help me launch it? it should it be on a napkin? Should I have a prototype? Does it not really matter? Or, or walk us through that. I love when an inventor calls me up from the beginning. Okay. And the reason I do is because I can help them right away. Sure. Uh, I just have to say that it's very easy to call up companies that are, whether you see them on, on TV, advertising, or, or uh, online, but it's very important that you do your due diligence and to know what kind of company you're calling, who you're calling, ask them if they've ever invented anything in their life, the other side of the person that you're talking to, uh, get references, referrals. I mean, just like anything in life, you want to get you want to ask somebody for who they've worked with and check out their work. Sure. Um, but when, when I speak to an inventor, it's very important to me that they do spend a few minutes at least to start online to see if their idea already exists. And let's say if I have, I came up with this great invention, it's a pencil with a LED light on top. Okay. Right. So I would put in pencil with LED on top or, or light bulb on top of pencil and, I just spend time online searching and searching because so far it costs me zero and right. it's just my time. And if I see that it's a hit, then move on to your next idea. You know what? I have to say, Kevin, most of the time, and this is a line I love to use and I, this sure. is like really, really important. I always tell inventors search to find it. Don't search not to find it because it's going to hurt you time, money, energy, effort in the long run. Right. I find inventors are closing their eyes while they're searching and tell me their idea is not out there. Or they go to, or they go to Walmart and they don't see the, their product on the shelf. And now all of a sudden they want to run with theirs. I see. So it's really important to do the due diligence. And that's when I love to start off with just saying, I know there's nothing else out there like it. This is the gazillion dollar idea. But let's take a step back. Let's start off from scratch and see what's out there, what the opportunity is. And and, and I have a really good example of that, Kevin, also okay, to, help, sure. to help inventors if you want to hear it. Yeah, I'd love to. So let's say you come up with a, with, with a golf ball idea. Okay. And you call me up and or you, you talk to your friends and family and you're telling me everybody in the world is going to want to want to use my golf ball invention okay okay i don't know what it does but it sounds really interesting right sure yeah <laughs> but anyway enough. uh so you look at you're you're at the golf course and you look around and you go oh man everybody plays golf this is unbelievable but when you go to a restaurant or you go to a kid's school function or whatever and you ask people do you play golf do you play golf do you play golf I mean, there's some people that play golf, but not everybody in the world plays golf. Sure. So like even with my pull ties invention, uh, yeah. it's the bag sealer. If I went on QVC and I said, this bag sealer is for, for bread, for bread bags. So it keeps them safe. Okay. Uh, it keeps them fresh. Right. Yeah. So if I just focus on bread, 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 I have a limited window of opportunity. Right. So the golf ball is very niche. If you play golf, fine. If you don't, you're not going to need it. So I don't know how many people end up playing golf, but let's say you, I have my two hands out right now, uh, kind of at a distance. Okay. So how many people play golf? So now I move my hands much closer together. Sure. And out of those, there's a gazillion golf balls that are out there. So how many people are going to really use mine? So it's small and it's niche. So sure. it is possible I don't know if it could be the blockbuster hit that everybody in the world is going to want, but maybe it's something that you can continue with and, and manufacture yourself and, and earn some money. I don't know how rich and successful and everything else or what success might mean to you, but sure. You, you know what? Just having the idea and making it and having somebody use it is like the biggest accomplishment for me. I love when people use the products that I come up with. Totally. So, if it's, if it's even a few people, that's fine. 
But now back to my pull ties, for example. If sure. I kept saying bread, 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 I'm limited. But then I said, now it's good for the freezer. So you can use it for freezer bags. And then you can use it in the pantry. Right. And then you can use it in the and So I just kept opening up my hands wider and wider for a bigger net of opportunity. And now all I have to say is how many people have a kitchen? Yeah. So now, now it was like, that's why I did well over $2 million of pull ties wow. uh, sales. And now they're going into back into retail again, into some of the major uh, retailers. So, and, and we just keep changing a little bit of the uh, color and some material and making it better and better every time. So, in 2019, we're, we're back into retail again in some of the major retails. That's awesome. Retail stores. Congrats, man. That's huge. Thanks. So you wrote Fun a couple. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. So you wrote a couple books. Let's talk about each book and, and what is it about? Sure. The first one I wrote was in 2006. Okay. And it was called You and Your Big Ideas. And you know what, Kevin? When I was doing the, I was going to these inventor groups and I felt like it was good because I was in that, that group of networking and people local and just getting in that world. Then I wanted to get the message out more because I, I had some level of success then. Okay. And I was like, you know what? I want to get the message out, but I don't want it to be about me. I want to help inventors. So sure. I wrote this book and it's almost like a choose your own adventure type of book where if it's not this, then it's this. Okay. And you could keep going this way. And, and that one, I've had some great reviews and feedback and I, I love helping people with it. And when I do different speaking events and innovate innovation, speaking events, like I love giving my book out or having people buy it, but I try sure. to give out as many as I can helping cool. also students, uh, with, with, uh, the book cause I made it simple reading. And sure. then, uh, and then I recently came out with another one called I, Inventing Secrets. I, Sorry. So I was just going to say, you also turned the you and your big ideas into an online course, correct? Just before we get into the second book. I did, book. yep. So I did. Walk us through that quickly before we cover the second book. Uh, I, I worked with a company to uh, to convert it into a, a course. Okay. Um, I wasn't I wasn't 100% focused on it. It is available, but uh, I'm doing my own because that was in 2006, and that's 13 years ago now. Sure. So things have changed. My resources have changed. I've been doing this now for over 15 years. So there's a lot of interesting new information and ways to do things. I mean, back then, you know what, Kevin, it was so difficult to even get a prototype made with a 3D printer. Sure. I mean, I was making them, I was making them in Canada. Interesting. So, yeah. So, I mean, now I just, my, you and your big ideas course is almost the speaking events that I do gotcha. more to individuals and companies and, and groups than, than just having an online course. So I could go back to it soon, but you know what? Many people are looking for one-on-one -on -one individual sure. talk, uh, communication and, and sessions. And that's what I do is I spend a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with inventors. I sign a non-disclosure agreement and, and, uh, and we talk about their ideas. And again, I'm not afraid to tell people the truth. If it's something that I feel and not just because I feel it and it's my emotional, you know, how I, it's not just my opinion is what I'm trying to say. Right. I base it on fact and okay. I help you to make better decisions. If it's something you want to move forward with or, or move on to your next idea. Sure. I, I think that's actually really good advice because when you're so close to something Sometimes you're not open or even if you don't even realize you're doing it, you just don't even see the flaws or the potential flaws with your idea or your product. So having a objective third party as early on as possible is almost priceless. It sounds like you're going to agree with that. Yeah. Okay. A hundred percent. You know why? Because when you come up with this idea, yeah. You have this emotional attachment to it and sure. it's your baby. And like I said before, you want it to be successful. Right. But there's got to be a point where you separate it. You slice it right down the middle and you say, take my emotion out. And now let me focus on business. Is this a business idea that I'm going to be spending money on, that I'm going to be focused on, that I'm going to be breathing every day? I got to take that out and just focus on the idea. And I have to make a decision from a business perspective 
is it something that I want to move on and move, move forward with or move on from and be realistic. And if you can't make that decision, then I'm happy to help you. But I, I wrote an article uh, and it basically said, am I, am I a heartbreak? Like I'm almost coming up with your, like you have this idea and I'm breaking your heart because I'm telling you that it already exists. Right, and then right. some people get mad at me because I told them that I think it's in their best interest to move on. And then I get a phone call later on that says, you know, Brian, you're so right. I'm happy. I didn't, I didn't do that, but I have this better idea now. So when you're in that zone yeah. of coming up with ideas, it may not be that one, but it's okay. Like move on. It's fine. It was a great idea. You're in that zone. You're, you're aware of what's going on around you and your environment. And you'll come up with another one, I promise. Sure. Well, and I also think, too, if you come up with an idea that's brilliant and somebody else made it, that doesn't mean your idea was bad. Like, if anything, it's complete validation. Sure, you're not the one that gets to reap the benefits of that, but you're right. Like, it's if you thought of a great idea once, sure, it got built. Somebody just thought of it before you. That doesn't mean that you're like a failure. You just need to figure out something else to your point. Absolutely. And you know what? I, there was my, my daughter is a very active inventor and she's come up with several ideas that, that we, we actually sell. But what's interesting is when she was coming up with the ideas, I would say, you know what, if you find it, I'm going to buy it for you because I'm so proud of you. So there was times where she was doing, and I'm like, you see, it's out there. You see, it's out there. But I started to catch on. Because she was like, Daddy, what if there's like a TV that you could swipe? Okay. okay. <laughs> so I was like, that's it. I'm stopping at the iPad. <laughs> I got her an <laughs> iPad and I caught on to her trick. But it, it's, it's interesting. Like you can come up with all these ideas and you know what? Be proud of it. Move on. Buy it. I mean, I, I always buy things that I come up with because I think they're cool. Uh, but they, they may not necessarily be mine. I can't call it my own, but it's cool to use. Very cool. So – Let's let's get actually get into that second book. Um, what exactly is it called, and, and what made you write a second one? My the second one is called Inventing Secrets Revealed. Okay, and I've been doing a lot of writing and blog posts and and just speaking to different inventors and just getting involved in the in the industry. So I wrote, I put all that together into into the book. Okay, uh, and it's it's personal. It's it's getting really deep. So it's almost like an advanced version of you and your big ideas the first book okay and i i love it i mean it's I, the, the greatest feeling just like i was saying when you have your product on the shelf and people are buying it and you're feeling great that they're using it the, like just being able to provide information to inventors sure no matter what media type uh outlet it is and and the book is one that i get a chance to get out there because people still like to read the books online or offline sure. and just have that physical copy in their hand so I do it, and uh, and and I enjoy giving it out at the different sessions that I that I do out there, or or people being able to buy it whenever they want, and it, whether it's on Amazon or all the major bookstores, you could just put in my name uh, in the in the search, and you'll see the couple books. And I wrote another one, but I have yet to publish it. Okay, it's coming in 2019 at some point, or you don't know. I think it's it. It will. It'll come out in, okay. in 19. I'm just waiting for, for the right time and I'm tweaking some things and uh, it's just I'm in the editing stage of that. Sure. So you've mentioned throughout the show that you do a number of speaking engagements. What exactly do you try to cover in those speaking engagements? I almost go through when you're coming up with an idea. Okay. And what to do first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and so on. Okay. And and giving you those options and putting you in that environment uh, and, and experience of, of what to do and, and what to expect and, and how to prepare yourself. And one of the most recent ones, which I really loved, is being a speaker for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Sure. By the way, they're a tremendous resource for inventors. I mean, if you use their website, you, if you're an inventor or you're coming up with an idea, uh, or even in, in, with trademarks, just uh, coming up with a good name for for an, a product or a business. Uh, USPTO.gov okay. is a great website, and it also has inventor resources and tools on there. Um, but I had a chance to speak at uh, their um, trade show. Uh, actually, it's called Invention Con. It's a convention. Okay. And I got to be able to be myself, 
show inventors that some of the products and, and involvement that I've been in with uh, in the inventor world and being able to deliver the message of, of uh, how to take the idea to market uh, through different mediums. And also, again, not being afraid to just say that this isn't the one, I'm going to move on to my next one. So I, it's, it's like amazing when people come to you and they're like, Brian, you're talking my language. Like, that's exactly what I was thinking, that's what awesome. I was doing. You're helping me to make better decisions. And that's, that's my goal. I woke up and I'm, I'm like, you know what? That, that's, that's my purpose. Like, I'm showing people that if I can do it, you can do it. Very cool. So I'm curious, though, walk us through some of the stuff around how much money should you actually put into maybe your first product? I know that's probably a really hard question to answer because it really depends on the product that you're trying to build. But you... I think like you watch shows like Shark Tank and I'm not trying to be mean, but like some people spend hundreds of dollars, maybe a couple thousand dollars on their first iteration of prototype. And then you see the people where they're, they've dropped a few million dollars and they seem to kind of get crucified. So is there kind of a, a thought or a rule that you like to tell people that, you know, maybe only spend X amount of dollars before you maybe decide to either give up or keep going or, or what's your thoughts on how sure. much to spend? What's interesting. What's interesting is that it doesn't matter if you're a doctor, a lawyer, high okay. profile person, unemployed, senior citizen, student. The point is everybody's at different levels of, of financial uh, stability in their life. Sure. And no matter what, I'm always thinking shoestring bootstrap inventor and, okay. and it's okay, but it's relative to what you want to do. If you want to go into your own business and manufacture and you have the finances to do it because you're going to, sometimes your tooling is involved. If it's plastic injection molding, right? Maybe if it's wood, just different types of materials, sometimes cut and sew is a lot easier and could be easier on financial uh, uh, budgeting coming up with with that idea and making a decision if you're going to manufacture it or license is sure. license it is going to make a big difference to how much money you're going to spend so if i'm going to license it i want to be able to get to a point where i can show it and it, it kind of works and and it's the way it should be as right. close as possible so how much is that going to cost kevin so when i come up with it i'm going to do my research online that we spoke about right plus you zero just your time Sure. Three hours, four hours. I'm okay with that. I'll do it, you know, over a glass of wine at night and things start to look a little different. Yeah, <laughs> when I get fair to enough. <laughs> couple of glasses after, but uh, j just being able to go through that costs you nothing. Then uh, to be able to uh, make a, a CAD file, the 3D okay. drawing of it. So maybe I hire a product designer or engineer right. and it might cost me a few hundred to a few, maybe a thousand or a few thousand dollars. And then I take that, I convert it into a prototype. So a 3d prototype, right? Um, I, I could end up sending it out or, uh, I go to a local, uh, 3d printing. I can even go to my local college or I send people to their local colleges to print it out. Or you don't even have to do the 3d file, the drawing or, or the prototyping. You could just find things that already exist and rip them apart and add things to them and change them or twist them and turn them and, get them as close as you can. Gotcha. And then now you're all set. So you, you have something to show. Uh, you, you might want to get a, a patent search done. And I, I usually do that in the beginning okay. uh, after I do my own search. And that'll cost you anywhere between $500 and $1,000 roughly. Okay. And that's going to take what you find. That'll take what you find. You give it to a patent attorney or agent. Have them compare what you found to what your idea is. And then let them show you what's out there in the patent world and then give you an opinion if it's right. patentable or not. And if they say it's patentable, I get a second opinion because I'm going to be spending a lot of time and, you know, I want to make sure that I'm going to proceed properly. And if they say no, that I hit a brick wall, I'm done. I'm out. So I spend zero most of the time except the cost of the, the, the patent search. Okay. Uh, so I'm making that. Uh, and then I end up going to uh, I, I end up going to the, the patent state. So maybe I'll file a provisional patent application. 
Okay. And that'll give me the right to say that my idea is patent pending for one year and, uh, and be able to show it uh, without having necessarily somebody sign a non-disclosure agreement. I know some people could agree with me on that or not, but that's what I do. Okay. Uh, so I have that. Um, and, and then I try to get a deal that way. And uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I have a year to try to get that deal. And if I don't, then uh, I have to make a decision. Am I going to continue with it? Or uh, and file a non-provisional patent application, or am I going to file a design patent, or am I going to just cut it and move on to my next idea? Okay. Um, but if if you're trying to manuf- if you're going into your own business, you want to get really down to the specifications of when you're making that prototype and getting closer to production and 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 starting to work with a factory to figure out how much it's going to cost and and what you're going to do when you have 5000 units in your garage and how you're going to distribute it so uh i mean even down to when you're in some of the retailers and they end up using a coupon uh for the store the vendor ends up paying for it so you have to make sure that you have the right margins to be able ah, to make it make it worthwhile so okay. a, a lot of a lot of things that you have to consider and and that's why again uh i try to make it easy for people uh, because I've already been there, done that. I've made the mistakes. I've learned many things from my experience of talking to inventors and interviewing high profile guests on my show sure. uh, that I had back in the day. I, I really feel like I, I've rounded myself with being able to just hear somebody talk to me about something and my brain just kind of like sifting through and filtering where it could be and who's going to be using it and how much money you can make from it. Sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. And and you're right. You don't realize how valuable having experience is until you have experience. That's that's my own personal opinion anyway, in any industry. You have to, again, you can learn things and you, you could be great at anything. The sure. question is, how many things do you want to be great at? How much time do you have to get there? And it's just a decision that you have to make. So, uh, just like, uh, you know, sometimes you have to make a decision also. You go to somebody for a general doctor or do you go to a specialist sure. and, uh, and you want to get right down to the core of what, what needs to get accomplished. So between having my team that does the, the patent searching or the, and, and a patent agent, uh, patent attorneys, uh, uh, 3D drawing, you know, you know, CAD file or product designers and, and three prototypers and manufacturers and web designers and search engine optimization and press releases and communications, just all these different variables that are needed through the process. That's I, I built a team that, that can help kind of streamline all that. And, and it really starts with me first. I mean, I'm still up in the front making right. sure that it's something that you should move forward with in my best opinion, or maybe you should can and, uh, and, and just helping guide you and help you make better decisions. Sure. So what exactly do you guys, do you have different kind of packages or how do you price your services? Well, it's my time. Okay. Uh, so I, I end up most of the time I end up just, if, somebody has something quick and they want to just run it by me most of the time i'm just getting it done you know in a few minute phone call sure um but if somebody wants to sit down and brainstorm their idea hear my opinions and suggestions and and help them and guide them and and then have access to my team that does the different parts of the invention stages that's when that's when you'll spend some time with me and okay. and you'll pay me for my time. Sure. And then if it ends up being something that I like and I have a good contact for, then I'll represent it as a, a licensing agent. So okay. uh, th- there's different different stages of of what needs to get done and and where. But okay. uh, again, it's I I know I know already. Like somebody tells me something, I know which who I'm using and how I'm doing it, and and right. if it's something that they want to do. But it it gets even deeper than that, Kevin, because Everybody, like I can have a doctor call me up and money's no object. Right. I can have a student that wants to do something and bootstrap. So like I get personal with people. It's sure. not just about your idea. I need to know where you want to go and how, and I can help you how to get there. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So when you say licensing agent, if I have a product, I get you to be my licensing agent. 
What does that really mean, and how do you – like, what does a licensing agent do? So if you have an idea that uh, you developed, uh, and again, if it, you didn't bring it up to the point of having a prototype, I would help you. But let's okay. say you come to me now with a prototype, yeah. and it's a, a kitchen uh, gadget, and I think it's pretty interesting, and I know already in my brain of which – company i would end up presenting it to sure uh and i'm also we didn't mention it but i'm very active with as seen on tv so there's a lot of products that people come to come to me with that could either be niche or it could be mass uh and i can end up uh basically i take it and i represent the idea um to the different uh licensees and if it ends up working out i'll I'll handle the contract negotiation. I'm not an attorney, but I, I've right. done pretty well getting it to about 98% of the agreements to be completed. Very cool. Um, and, and then I make sure that the sell-through reports are correct. The royalty reports are correct. I keep the relationship going. I, I have to say, look, I'm an inventor also, so I can say this. And it's, I've been there before. In my first licensing deals, I'm calling the licensee all the time, and, and they're not into that. So Got they you. appreciate that I'm the liaison between the inventor and them gotcha. where uh, question most of the time, the questions that they have, I'm able to answer I and, and they like that. So um, I'm keeping the relationship very uh, amicable and, and dealing with a, a lot of the issues in between and, and being the spokesperson. And, and uh, I just, I'm involved with the, with the transaction for as long as the agreement is, is in place. No, that that makes a lot of sense. And but uh, we're coming to the end of the show, so let's close mm-hmm. with mentioning where people can get more information about you and any other links you want to mention. Sure, my the easy one is brianfree dot com, and and I have to say, if you spell my name B R A I N instead of B R I A N, and you say my last name the way it's spelled, then I'm brain fried. So <laughs> please don't spell it that way because I don't know what comes up. But sure. Brianfree.com is my uh, is my website, my personal. Uh, my my company, Inventus Smart, is inventusmart.com, just the way it sounds. Sure. And uh, United Inventors Association, uiausa.org. You can sign up for free as a member on there. We also, obviously, if there's corporations listening, uh, please. Uh, we're looking for sponsorships all the time, and there's a lot of activity that goes on in the inventor community that you could be front uh, front and center with cool. and uh U S patent and trademark office. I mean, that's a gold tremendous resource for inventors and uh, just being involved in, in uh, your inventors clubs locally. And if you don't have one close to you, then reach out to me and I can help you to start one. Very cool. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show and I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day, man. Thank you very much, Kevin. I appreciate it. And everybody out there, keep on inventing. Keep on coming up with great ideas. But do your research and think about moving forward. And and hopefully people out there can use it while you came up with it. Thank you, Kevin. Perfect, man. Well, you have a good rest of your day, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community. Sign up for our newsletter or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.